Mia, you work in um, the, the uh, Child and Adolescent Centre in Zagreb. You're working with a whole range of child abuse issues. What brought you into working with um, Amy Nation? Well, when I first uh, started working in Child and Youth Protection Centre of Zagreb, uh, my thought was that most difficult cases for me would be sexually abused children and severely physically abused children. But the most uh, uh, the most challenging part was actually working with emotionally abused children. Why? Because they often pass under the radar of many experts and many systems because their wounds are not as visible as the other ones. And maybe 25, 30 years ago, it was similar, for example, sexually abused children. But today we really recognize that and we react as a society. But emotionally abused children are not on that uh, point yet. Hmm. Uh, and then into that group, uh, we have alienated children. And their wounds are often even harder to see. They are so well covered up and wrapped uh, into this uh, shield. And uh, it's often denied, it's often misinterpreted. And that uh, wakes up my inner scientist, psychotherapist, human, all at once. Mm. So, so that hidden nature of, of uh, the alienation of a child and what that means in terms of, uh, of child abuse and what that means in terms of longer term harm to that child has been very much hidden from yes. uh, public consciousness. And, and I think perhaps very much hidden from our own um, consciousness until we came into being confronted directly by these children. And for me, um, I've done this work with divorce and separation for 25, 30 years, thereabouts. Um, and it's only really been the past 10 to 12 years that I've started to, to move further and further into the world of the alienated child and to recognize the, the deep roots of harm that are left behind when a child has been alienated and the deep roots of harm which are left if we don't intervene at the time that this happens. So many people will say, well, it's just a, a it's just a contact dispute, or you know, this is just what happens. Uh, leave them, leave them be, and they they'll come back to you. And we know that many children do come back over time, but we also know now because we are now working with second, third, fourth generation children of divorce and separation. You know, when they come into the consulting room, there is a particular quality of experience that they are bringing. So I'm working with adults who, who were alienated as children, and there are very similar themes, um, hidden, especially from themselves, um, an experience of um, uh, not knowing the self in the way that other children might know the self, not being able to trust the self in the way that other people might be able to trust the self, and not having a sense of an integrated whole. So all of us are working from a perspective where we know there's something hidden. We came to it because we wanted to know more about what was, was happening. Let's, let's think about um, now, let's think about what is actually happening to children who outright reject a parent. And I want to make it very specific who outright reject a parent when there is nothing to substantiate um, them doing that, when there is no evidence for why they might do that. What's, what's your understanding of what's happening? Let's start with Claire. This is a very important question. I have two things in mind. One is the double bind. And this is unfortunately why sometimes these cases are referred to family therapy, the generic kind. Okay, because, of course, there is a double binding language in the situation. So children keep getting confused messages about what mom is doing, what dad is doing. And somehow there is this assumption, uh, I think it's because of the lack of awareness, that even sometimes court refer these situations to family therapy or co-parenting intervention, which is gaining popularity in, our, in my country. But... It is not a solution to the double bind, as it is not a solution to the splitting either. So what happens is, because of these mixed messages, children then decide to have their own, create their own narratives for daddy 
and the narrative for mommy, and these narratives don't match. So I, as a therapist, get both narratives. Mm. So kind of I'm in a position where I hear what the child has to say about mommy and what the child has to say about daddy, and there's absolutely no match in the narrative. Mm. So two very different narratives, yes. two very different realities, two very different internalized realities for the child and an inability to integrate those in any way. So even the behavior is different. So I can see, I see. So if I'm seeing the child with mommy and the child, same child with daddy, it's as if I'm seeing a different child altogether sometimes. Their behavior, it's amazingly different. Even language, even the body posture, even the non verbals are very indicative that there is the split. The child seems to be fulfilling two different roles as a child to his or her parents. Mm -hmm. Kelly, um, two different roles as a, a, as a child. Have you seen that child in those, those split states of mind? Oh, absolutely. And it seems to me that it's, it's a loss of the child's genuine an authentic voice, right? So what I hear from the child is um, it, it's not the child's own voice. It's usually the voice of the parent that they're most aligned with. And so in, in that, yet they lose uh, the richness of, of a personality, right? It seems uh, when you talk about them being disconnected from them, themselves, um, there's there's a portion of their psyche and their psych psychology that they they cannot access because to do so creates too much conflict. Um, so, so so that disconnection from the self, from the authentic self, produces um, I guess what Winnicott would call the false persona, a false self which is adapted in order to be able to survive the the double bind. Um, Mia. Uh, tell us about the children that you see uh, at, at the clinic. Do you see that kind of split self and, and, and the movement back and forth from different personnel, almost almost seeming like different personalities? They're not different personalities, but they can appear to be that way. Yeah, of course they can appear to be that way. And that fake persona can o often reminds me of the parent who is actually abusive, who is alienating the child. Uh, not just uh, in narrative, but in some uh, really, really subtle matters like the way they wave the hair or the, the way they say some things, uh, like a, a little version of that parent mm -hmm. often. So when, when we define alienation, for example, in Croatia, a lot of people uh, define alienation as a child unreasonable rejection of one parent and idolizing the other parent. And I think that's okay to make the phenomena clear and simple to the public, but in real psychotherapeutic work, that kind of definition is not sufficient and it's not layered enough to achieve, uh, achieve deeper understanding and healing beyond reunification. Mm -hmm. So that child's pleasant state of mind that, that you are mentioning and sense of the parents most often reflects child's inner defense and splitting, mm -hmm. uh, which is a really a primitive defense mechanism developed to harmonize uh, intrapsychic life in abusive environment. Mm -hmm. And if we just establish the contact between the child and previously rejected parent, that's, I think that's step one. That's not the final step uh, in the therapy. Mm. So there are multiple layers of inter, uh, intrapsychic splitting, as we call it. So the internal world of the child is, is almost sort of cut into ribbons um, at times um, as the child maladapts and finds ways of, 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 of existing in a very fractured um, uh, world, often fractured externally, yeah. And, but beginning to fracture internally and then my experience that, projecting that on the outside world yeah so that projection onto the outside world onto the parents my experience then is that the parents themselves start to counter fracture and so when we arrive on the scene what we're met with is a sort of um, almost a car crash of, of um, inter and intrapsychic schisms and splits, which we then have to find a way to, to bring together. Joan, um, what's your experience of working um, with children who have that kind of splitting? How, how are they presenting in your uh, consulting room? 
But I would tell you this, that they tend to present as perfect, the majority of kids I've met in this kind of situation, they present as very perfect little human beings and they tend to excel quite a bit in whether it's um, school, exams, extracurricular sports, that they are kind of the perfect children very often. Mm -hmm. But of course, the pressure they're under is huge. You know, just like Mia said there, it's like there's this primitive defense mechanism that they have built up so strongly. And, you know, it's, it's awfully sad because these children aren't in the normal development of their intrinsic self because they can't access that. Mm -hmm because they are so intent and utterly obsessively focused on the alienating parent that that's all they have. So they cannot go there and you get the extremes, total extremes. Mm. That is the parent that they tend to live with is the perfect parent. Mm. And, you know, again, like some of the other speakers were saying that even the language that's used is very often in my experience adult type of language terminology that's used by adults um and it's just this presentation that is so defensive and extremely extremely developed that it's so difficult so difficult for them mm. and of course my concern is what is going to happen to this child when they grow up because this is the perception they're going to have of the world as well yeah and how yeah, age. yeah. So that longer term risk to the child, if we don't intervene, um, it's very apparent, isn't it, in the consulting room, because the division into good and bad, the split into idealised parent and demonised parent, then begins to reflect into the outside world. So, so the, the child takes that core split and starts to see the outside world as if that's the truth of the matter. Benny, can I ask you, um, uh, Joan said there, that one of the things that that um, she sees is that the child is doing very very well at school um, for example but in other elements of their life they're doing extraordinarily well and yet there is this very fixed pattern of behavior in relationship to their parents is that something that you see in your work yes a lot of them do well uh, especially in school and in, in different activities, and and like and like Joanne said, you know, find make the effort to to present it usually up front, and their parents, especially the alienating parent. And you're asking what what children do I meet, but I feel when I hear all of us, I, I'm meeting the same children, and in different in six different societies or countries. And I, so I can identify with every type of uh, vignette or, or characteristic of, of how each of us is talking about these children. And I, I feel that there are children that are caught in between in an impossible situation, but there's something very subtle about it. I mean, it's not like in domestic violence, especially in physical violence, or, or so that's clear to see. And, and sometimes the behaviors are up front, but here things are in between the lines are very subtle. And, the, and, these, and, and, you know, and, and the adaptive abilities of, of, of humans and especially of children to, to, to please and, 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 and not, not to rock the boat. And, and also as a parent to, to, to two young girls, I see that it's so easy to mold children. If, if it's so easy to, to when, 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 when if parents are not dysregulated, if parents are dysregulated or or are troubled in, in so many ways. It's so easy to maneuver children, and and so, and and it, and the effect is so sometimes so uh, complete. And when I hear the so the lack of ambivalence and the lack of empathy, sometimes when I hear you know the way children suppose they allow themselves to speak to to to, to the a parent, which is obviously you know if you take a hundred people, ninety nine percent would say this is rudeness or this is this is not the way to speak to a parent so some there's something in, in the way that they suppose they allow themselves and I have to remind rejected parents that it's not it's not that the, the boy is rude or the, the girl is 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 cruel it's, it's, she's caught in between uh, both her parents in an impossible situation and she's she's just shot herself in a corner that that's her defense to to kind of not you know not not to be troubled, but too much information and, and nuances and, and complexity. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about Salvador Minuchin, um, a father of family therapy, who said the only time a child looks down on the other on the pa- a parent is when they're standing on the shoulders of the of the other. And I think it was Linda Gottlieb who uh, introduced me to 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 that thought at the conference that we held in in London, and it stayed with me ever since. In no other setting have I seen children become so contemptuous, cold, and disdainful towards a parent and be given permission to behave in that way by a parent that that they're in the care of. We're kind of drilling down now into the reality of, of what we're working with. And like you said, Benny, there are, there are six of us here from six different countries in the world. And yet we're all talking about very similar patterns of behavior. Kelly, can I ask you about... Um, the differentiation of uh, alienation. Um, how do we know that a child is alienated? What are we seeing in front of us? We've, we, we've had a few glimpses. Let, let's drill down now and talk about what are we looking at? What do we see? You know, the characteristic that really jumps out that I've heard each of us speak about is this um, Uh, level of hatred and animosity that comes through the child that is just not representative of a of a normal child Uh, forgive me for using the word normal but um it really is the thing that leaps out first because children are not naturally full of hate and Um, And they're not even naturally unforgiving. I often say that one of the hallmarks for for me um, when I'm doing an assessment is that the problems that are mentioned by the child or the reasons for not having contact are not problems to be solved. Um, And that's what, because they're, they're not willing to solve those problems. They can't solve those problems because they're stuck right there, right? Um, and so I, and I think that what goes along with that, whenever there are any allegations of abuse, the very, one of the first things you have to do is to, uh, look very closely at that and look at the, uh, the records and the, the allegations and the investigations that have been done. Um, but oftentimes, even when I have a parent that's had substance abuse issues, real substance abuse issues in a case where the child has not been um, encouraged to remain angry at the parent. If the parent gets treatment and improves, there's a relief in the child. There's a, there's, there's happiness and joy that they have their parent back to them. Um, and the parent's not altered anymore and they can have good quality time. Whereas if there's been a substance issue and another parent has used that to generate hatred and unforgiveness um, in the in the child, then you see that no, it doesn't matter how long the parent is sober, the child won't forgive them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so those are characteristics that stand out to me when mm-hmm. I first. So we have a rigidity of position and thinking in the child um, and, and a, a lack of willingness to, to, to go into a place where forgiveness is, it, it, it can be given. Um, on the other um, uh, end of things, we also have children using really flimsy reasoning. I don't know if anybody else has, has had this, but I've had... Um, a number of kids with with really flimsy reasoning. I'm not going to see my my mother ever again because she makes me eat broccoli. And when when we question, isn't that the role of mothers to make you eat things that you don't like? Broccoli, it may not be a very nice vegetable, but that's your mum's role to make you eat things that are good for you. They will escalate that and say, yeah, but I'm, I'm allergic to broccoli. And she knows I'm allergic to broccoli. And she made me eat um, broccoli and she tried to kill me. So it's that escalation um, from, from something which is, is, is um, not, some, not a reason to, to reject a parent completely to a very dramatic uh, a sort of positioning in the child. And again, 
um, it becomes very rigid, it becomes very stuck, very focused in um, unforgiveness. Mia, do you see that in, in, in the clinic, in your work? Yeah, I was just thinking about some case examples. When you told me, uh, when you told us this, uh, just l last week, uh, a girl told me that, that her father, she's afraid of him because he is a murderer. And I asked her, oh, what do you mean by that? And then she said that uh, she knows that he has been in the civic war, as well as a lot of people, of course, in, in Croatia at that period of time. And people in war, they go there to kill people. And that means that he killed people, and that means he is a murderer, and I know he loved it. Mm -hmm. They never talked about that, but she made that presentation of, of her father in her head. Mm -hmm. So uh, many experts in this field work mostly with alienation, and then they have a problem that maybe they, they think they would have a problem deciding if, if this was real abuse or this is alienation. Uh, I have a chance to work with abused and traumatized children overall. And once you see the difference, it's really hard to make a mistake in differentiation after that. Mm -hmm. uh, is this a good time to show you some sudden drawings to illustrate what I'm talking yes, about? Yeah, that would be really helpful. Just let me just let me check what, what you said there, um, Mia. You, what you said was when you, you work with abused children, and yeah. alienated children, yes. but, so children whose whose parents have been abusive, um, and children who's, who's, who 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 are rejecting a parent and saying that they're abusive, but but there's no evidence for that. So yes, show us show us um, some of your work. Yeah, I can do that. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So here in slide number one. I put four drawings. So this one on, on the left, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a drawing that was made uh, on instructions Romeo family. Uh, so that one is from a family, the father was really abusive in that family. So child who is really afraid of the abusive parent usually puts him or her into the family drawing. And the drawing itself is traumatic but most of the time includes both parents. An alienated child does not want to draw the rejected parent. So you see that on these drawings in the middle. Uh, I said, please draw me your family, and then she drew herself and her mom. And then I said, who else is there? And she drew uh, her uh, godmother. Who else is there? Godfather. Who else is there? There is a dog. I don't know if you see the dog, but there is a small dog next to the mom. And then is there somebody else? No. Can you please draw me a father? No. The, the other child drew the father, actually, but of course it was first her, mom, sister, then the dog, then the cat, then the trees, then the sun, clouds, everything. Mm -hmm. And when I specifically said, please uh, draw your father, she drew this uh, demon coming down from the, from the sky. And this is a perfectly uh, adequate parent. Mm -hmm. with no history of abuse or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I also put this drawing on the right uh, because a lot of people, at least in our region, are still uh, confuse high-conflict divorce and alienation or induced splitting. So children in high-conflict divorces also suffer and sometimes they are emotionally neglected and abused, but it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So this is the drawing when, when we said Romeo family. And that boy drew mother, father, and himself in the middle. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the title of the drawing is, when you're just looking at each other, you don't see me. Mm -hmm. But he put both of them, and he's feeling bad, something is going out of his head. Uh, and he, he, is, he is sad in this drawing. Of course, Sorry, in, first, Sorry, in the first drawing, uh, the children are, uh, are also traumatized. But in the drawings in the middle, children are really happy and the other parent is not existing in the picture. Yeah. So I think that this really sh shows that uh, a, little, a little bit better when, when we have it exactly from the children. Mm -hmm. These are some drawings of really abused children when we say, draw me yourself. Yeah. So that's how abused children see themselves. Or for example, this one. So this is the drawing of self. And these are some adjectives describing the child. So the child said, Awful, crazy, fat, baby, coward, stupid, bad, black, unstable, dead, little, lazy, and so on. Yeah. But when it comes to alienated children, they think they're great. 
yeah. uh, on the surface and they will draw them, themselves something like that. Yeah, so that's yeah. also a difference we, we are looking for. This here uh, are some, uh, this is the one the psychological test, some structured uh, sentences. So we start a sentence and then we ask the child to uh, finish the sentence, like the first thought that comes to their mind. So when we have a real abuse, uh, that, that's on the bottom, uh, with my mom I like to cook and watch TV shows, with my dad I like to drive in the car, or stuff like that. If I could change anything about my dad, is to make him not angry so that he could be kind. Mm -hmm. This father was abusive and the child witnessed family violence. And when we have a splitting, then it's something like that. With my mom, I like to talk. With my dad, I like to not think. Yeah. With my mom, I don't like. Me and my mom never do anything I don't like. I mean, that, that's just not, not normal for adolescent to write that down. With mm -hmm. my dad, I do not like see him. If I could change anything about my mom, nothing. If I could change anything about my dad, I would change everything. So that's also uh, one way of making the difference between real abuse and, and alienation. Okay, I will stop here for now, and then maybe, maybe I, can, I can continue with some other examples and other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, I think maybe you need to uh, stop screen share. Uh, yes, uh, I will just stop a bit because I don't know how to... Okay, great. <laughs> we can edit the part. That's really helpful, and what you've what you've done in 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 those sort of um, examples of, of of what we might call projective testing yeah. um, is you've given us a, a, a glimpse into the 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 inside world, the internal world of how actually abused children um, see themselves. So what what I'm seeing there is that when children have been abused by a parent. Um, they 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 internalize that and see themselves as a bad person yeah. um and what we hear from them in the internalized uh description is is that they have absorbed they've interjected that that negative stuff and, and it's becoming part of their um self-image uh, how they feel about themselves in alienation where the child has been separated from their authentic self and they've developed this sort of, this false persona, what we see is all of the positive and none of the no. negative yeah. at all. Um, and I think that, that um, really dramatically depicts the difference for me. So Benny, is that kind of...